This is episode number 40 with Dr. Bruce Lipton. Welcome to the Melissa Ambrosini Show. I'm your host, Melissa, best-selling author of Mastering Your Mean Girl, and I'm here to remind you that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word. Each week, I'll be getting up close and personal with thought leaders from around the globe to uncover the habits, mindsets, tools, and rituals that they have used to become world so that you can create epic change in your own life and become the best version of yourself possible. Are you ready, beautiful? Bruce is an internationally recognized leader in bringing science and spirit together. He is a stem cell biologist, best-selling author, and a powerful speaker sharing his message that you can live the honeymoon effect and create heaven here on earth. Mm -mm -mm. Sounds good to me. His book, Biology of Belief, was one of the first self-help books I read many, many years ago, and it was such a pivotal moment in my life and such a pivotal book for me because I finally really understood the power of our thoughts and beliefs. So if you have any stinky, limiting, fear-based beliefs, you are going to love today's episode. In today's show, we chat about how knowledge is power why the first seven years of your life are crucial for our development of our belief system. So if you have children or you're thinking about having children, you guys are going to love this point. We also talk about how you can truly create and experience heaven here on earth, how to reprogram your negative limiting fear-based beliefs, the importance of self-love in living as though heaven is here on earth, And to hear a scientist talk about self-love, guys, your mind is going to be blown. We also chat about why your new hobby needs to be theta hypnosis, why repetition is your best friend when reprogramming your beliefs, why you need to fake it till you make it, how worrying is praying for what you don't want, how 90% of all disease is stress-related and how you can influence and impact and change your genes, plus so much more. And for everything that Bruce and I mentioned in today's show, you can check out in the show notes, and that is at melissaambrosini.com forward slash 40. And without further ado, let's bring on this super lovely, beautiful human being, Dr. Bruce Lipton. Bruce, what an honor. I am so excited to have you on the show today. But before we dive into our amazing conversation, can you please tell us what you had for breakfast this morning? I had almond bread and grass-fed butter uh, and a wonderful cup of coffee. That was that. It was great. Ah, delicious. Delicious. The whole idea is uh, keep away from the carbs uh, people don't recognize that the carbohydrates are the source of our, our biggest uh, health issues. And, and uh, it's unfortunate because uh, I loved all the things that were carbs. I tell you, you know, anything carbs is like, yeah. And then I realized that's the one that was bad. So uh, I, I'm enjoying a better life now cutting out the carbs. Yes, yes. The word science evokes a feeling of sterility rather than spirituality for me personally, but you're a very different type of scientist. In fact, it's not every day you meet a scientist that is bringing science and spirit together like you do. Can you take us back to Bruce Lipton in college? Did you know back then that this was going to be your path? Absolutely not. I was on a path to uh, just become a, a research scientist, a biologist and a research scientist, because I just love biology and nature it was so beautiful and microscopy. And in fact, uh, in graduate school, uh, I was an electron microscopist, which was for me so exciting. It's like uh, Star Trek in reverse is sort of instead of going out, out and out, uh, the electron microscope takes you in, in and in to see things that uh, people never have seen before. So every day when 
when I'd go to work, I'd look at cells and tissues and see things that nobody's ever seen. So it was like, oh, it was so exciting to go into work every day. It was wonderful. And of course, it ended up uh, with a very intimate knowledge of cells, their structure, and their function. Uh, and I learned a lot from them. What happened after college and and how did this all unfold for you? You know, your first book, which was just mind-blowing for so many people. (laughs) Including myself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Did you believe the biology of belief was going to have the impact it has had, not only on individuals' lives, but science as a whole? Uh, No, I don't know how much impact it has on science, but it surely has a a large impact on the public. Uh, Being able to read and understand the biology without all the Latin, uh, which, you know, keeps people from understanding what's going on. You just read some of the titles of research papers like, what the hell are they talking about? And the idea about it is uh, uh, science is like the church. They put stuff in in languages that nobody understands. So you just go there and go, oh, yes, oh, yes. And and the reality is it doesn't mean anything unless you can take it down so the public understands it. And there's a, a an important understanding because it's true for my own life and how this unfolded is there's a simple thing. It says knowledge is power, but a lack of knowledge is a lack of power. And when it comes to understanding your human biology and how it works, a lack of knowledge of self, by definition, is no self-empowerment. So the idea of what I got all excited about, because I was a student as much as a a researcher, when the cells were revealing the simple truths about life and nature, it was like I was like in awe, like, oh, my God, uh, and and started to learn from the cells. And then I realized uh, I had to really bring it down into a public conversation because it was so relevant and so important understanding of who we are and how we work that uh, it was really important to bring it down to a language the public can understand. And I, I believe biology belief is pretty close to that, considering uh, when I first wrote the first manuscript and it was in my conventional scientese, uh, I, I gave a copy of the manuscript to a couple of friends and I said, just take a look and tell me what you think. And then I had to track them down because they were avoiding me. <laughs> and the reason was... They said to me, Bruce, I didn't understand a damn word that you put in that book. And I realized, yes, science uh, science talk uh, does not translate to the public. And the information that I learned as a person of the public, not a researcher, as a, as a student of what I learned, uh, it's so transformative that it was a mission then at that point to uh, uh, just get it to the public. Let the public understand because when they realize how powerful they really are and, and how they've been programmed uh, to have uh, to be disempowered, uh, w- awakening to your power is the most magnificent experience on this planet. And, and the idea is yeah, we, when we wake up to this power, uh, it, it, life becomes heaven on earth. And, and it's interesting because uh, in my book, The Honeymoon Effect, It really feels a very interesting thing, and that is your life could suck every day, every day, every day, and then you meet this special person, and then like 24 hours later, life is like, oh my God, it's heaven on earth. Life is the most wonderful thing ever. And it's like, this is a dramatic transformation that that you move from regular life into what I call the honeymoon effect, where life is so blissful and beautiful. It's like, well, how come life sucked every day, and then 24 hours after falling in love, it's like, wow, it's heaven on earth. And the simple reality is, well, it's always heaven on earth. What happens is the moment we we uh, fall in love, it's the equivalent of taking the red pill in the movie The Matrix. We've been programmed, that's a fact, and falling in love is uh, the equivalent of a red pill because once you fall in love, you're out of the program. And then guess what? Now your creativity is not the regular life that you had up until that day you met this person. Now your creativity is manifesting heaven on earth. And the fact was, it was always there, except that um, we were uh, under the programming that we got in the first seven years of our life and unaware that our life was pre-programmed and we were just playing tape, so to speak, uh, uh, and not really expressing ourselves until that day we fell in love. And all of a sudden, it's like the red pill. We stop playing the programs that have disempowered us. And immediately, the consequence is heaven on earth. Well, 
that's heaven on earth every day if you get out of the programs. And that's what the most important insight is about this biology. We are very, very powerful, but we have been programmed to be frail and vulnerable and weak. And as victims, when you perceive yourself as powerless, as a victim, then you give up all your resources to someone who says they're going to help you. So like the medical profession is like, oh, you're sick. We are we're the ones that are going to help you. Give us all your resources. Uh, and, and people give up all this money when in fact, they basically have the power to heal themselves all the time. They just uh, have been programmed not to use that power. Okay. Wow. Let's unpack this. So you're saying all of our beliefs are instilled within us by the age of seven? Not all. The foundational beliefs of how to be a functional member of a family and to be a functional member of a community, the rules that, you know, like if you're going to get out of your house and you're going to be in a community there, you got to have rules to conform to the community. So the first seven years are the downloading of, of the rules uh, to be a functional member in that family, in that community. Uh, and you observe uh, the behaviors uh, by watching your mother, your father, your siblings, and those in your community in the first seven years. And it's interesting because the brain, through age up through age seven, the brain is in a, in a lower vibrational energy than consciousness. It's actually in what is called theta. Uh, theta vibrations are associated with imagination. Uh, and if you think about it, that kids under seven seamlessly mix the imaginary world and the real world together like a, a broom is a horse and really is a horse to that kid at that moment or a tea party with mud pies. No, that's an apple pie uh, and is real to them at that moment. But that's a theta, that's imagination mixing with reality. Uh, but we also have to recognize this theta is hypnosis. And so the simple reality is how many rules does it take, if you think about it, to be a functional member of a family in a community, to, to know how to, to navigate <laughs> through the, this complex web of life? How many rules? Well, thousands. Uh, I mean, just think about it this way. Uh, the way your father talks to you is not the way your father talks to another kid your age. It's not the way your father talks to your mother. It's not the way your father talks to the neighbor. It's not the way your father talks to the policeman. And all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, just in that little brief <laughs> summary right there, how many different behaviors are required at that moment. Uh, and I say, well, nature manifests uh, this hypnosis period, the first seven years of your life, uh, to allow us to observe family and community record their behavior, sort of like our brain for the first seven years is like on a video recorder. Everything we see and we hear is downloaded straight into the subconscious. Now, there's an important point about that. Conscious mind, you, the, 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 the special you, the, the spiritual you, uh, the unique identity you, conscious mind, is not engaged until after age seven. And then there becomes a, a significant problem right there, and that is, well, you're downloading behaviors, but is anybody like yourself critically reviewing these behaviors, or are you just downloading them? And the answer is the latter. In other words, conscious mind's not working, so whatever you observe, behavior, whether it was good or bad, you still download it because you're just on record. And after age seven, 95% of our life is based on the programs that we downloaded in the first seven years. And this is because our subconscious, which is where these behaviors are recorded. Look, as I said, I'm an infant. I got to grow up. I got to be part of the family and community. <laughs> you got to know how to behave. And so nature gives us seven years of hypnosis. Observe everyone around you. Observe their behavior. And then when you have that in your subconscious, you can use those programs to engage uh, in the community and the family you live in. Well, th this is really cool, except these are programs. And uh, as I mentioned, sometimes the programs are good and sometimes the programs are actually 70% of the time. The programs we downloaded in the first uh, seven years of life, 70% are disempowering, self-sabotaging, and limiting beliefs. Things that we engage in, we actually undermine our own life. But these are in the subconscious. These are just programs. There's nobody in the subconscious. It's equivalent like a CD player. You can push the button and select the program, and it'll just keep playing and playing. Well, that's the subconscious. After age seven, the conscious mind kicks in. Now, this is the part that where, if you don't understand it, this is why we get screwed up. Uh, 
The conscious mind is creative. The conscious mind is unique. That's, as I said, connected to your uh, specific identity, your spirituality. That's you, conscious mind. Uh, It is very creative. And compared to the subconscious, subconscious is almost all habitual. Whatever you downloaded, that's the habit. You push the button, you're going to play whatever that subconscious program is. It's not always bad programs. I mean, think about it this way. Uh, When you learned how to walk, you were probably less than two. And I say, well, once you learned how to walk and the program of walking was stored in the subconscious mind, have you ever had to learn how to walk again? And the answer is no. Ever since you were two, you've been just playing the same program. So the programs of subconscious are useful if the programs are good programs. But if the programs of subconscious are self-sabotaging, disempowering, and limiting, then when you engage those programs, you are undermining your life. So now... Uh, I want to just put everything back now into perspective because this is really critical for the listener. And it goes like this. When I'm in my conscious mind, I am creative and any ideas, wishes, desires, aspirations that I want, I am navigating my biology using my conscious mind as the, uh, as the pilot uh, and navigating what I want. However, when the conscious mind is thinking, so, you know, hey, uh, Melissa, what are you doing on Wednesday at 2 o'clock? Uh, if you actually contemplate that answer, w- where is it? <laughs> uh, the point I'm bringing up here is it's not out in front of you. The answer is inside your mind. So when you're thinking, what am I doing on that time at 2 o'clock? Uh, when you're thinking about it, your attention of your conscious mind is focused inward as you're having thoughts. Okay, now comes the the thing. And this is what people really have to understand. Only 5% of the day are we normally running our behavior with us as the pilot, the creative wishes and desires. Only 5% of the day are we navigating our biology, our vehicles, toward wishes and desires. 5%. The reason is science has recognized that 95% of the day we are thinking. Well, thinking means your conscious lets go of the wheel, goes inside and looks for answers. But that's when the subconscious is, that's the autopilot. The moment the conscious mind lets go of the wheel, subconscious kicks in and starts driving. It's a million times more powerful a computer than the conscious mind. So that's not a problem. And think about it this way. You're walking down the street and you have a thought. Because conscious mind went inside to have a thought doesn't mean you stop walking. You're still walking down the street. You didn't walk off the curb. You didn't hit a tree. I go, yeah, because when your conscious mind went inside to think, the subconscious mind, which is programmed how to navigate by itself and walk, took over. You're driving the car. You get into a conversation with a friend and you realize at some point you haven't looked out the windshield for five or 10 minutes. And I go, wow, uh, it looks like you're still driving okay. (laughs) And the point is this, when you were uh, using your conscious mind in conversation with a passenger, it meant you stopped paying attention to the road. So when your mind let go of the road, the subconscious autopilot, which knows how to drive, you programmed it, steps in and drives the vehicle. Very important, because I'm going to bring it up next, is this. Let's go back to that scene in the car. You're having a conversation for five minutes or so. Then you look out the window and you realize you haven't paid attention to the road for that five minutes, but you're still driving. Everything is cool. So then I ask you this. Tell me what uh, your conversation was about. Your conscious mind was engaged in conversation. Tell me what it's about. And you go, yes, we talked about this and this and this. Ah, but now I ask you, and tell me. What was on the road during the last five minutes when you were driving? And all of a sudden you realize, I don't know. (laughs) I didn't pay attention. I didn't see it. This is critical for this reason. 95% of the day we are in thought. That means 95% of the day our behavior is controlled by subconscious autopilot programs. But, and this is the but, Because your conscious is engaged, it's not paying attention to the current behavior. So whatever behavior is coming out of the autopilot, you don't see it because your conscious mind was indoors looking up stuff inside your head, and whatever the behavior was being expressed, conscious mind didn't see it. So uh, this is the the basis of a, a story I've told 20 years in my lectures because there's no better story. It's so perfect, and it makes the point. It goes like this. 
you probably uh, somewhere in your life had a friend, you were very close to your friend, and you knew your friend's behavior very well. And, and you happen to know your friend's parent. And one day you see that your friend has the exact same behavior as their parent. Well, this excites you, you know, so you got to tell your friend, you go, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. And then I say, back away from Bill. Bill goes ballistic. How can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my father. And most people have heard this. And I said, this is a very profound story for this reason. Very profound. Everyone else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. The only one who doesn't see it is Bill. Understanding is he downloaded the behavior of his dad in the first seven years, and 95% of the day he's thinking with his conscious mind, so the conscious mind lets go of the wheel, autopilot kicks in, he plays his dad's behavior. The issue is he's inside thinking while the behavior is playing outside, and he doesn't see it. So when somebody says, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad, he's shocked. How could anybody say that? And now... That's a very profound story, but now we'll just make it one step more profound, and that is we are all Bill. Every one of us is doing this every day. Every day we're playing 95% of our behavior from programs that we acquired in the first seven years primarily, that these programs are controlling the character of our lives, and yet we, like Bill, are the ones that are unaware of the program because it's playing when conscious mind's busy. Relevance. That makes us believe then we're victims because let's say we get up in the morning and the, the creative vision of the conscious mind, creative mind, wishes and desires is, today I'm going to go out and find my great relationship. Today I'm going to go out and get the best job. Today I'm going to get healthy. I say, this is good. This is your conscious mind, creative wishes and desires. First thing in the morning, great. Then you go out all day and when you come home at night, it's like, well, no, no, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't find that relationship and i um, still got the same old job and I'm not as healthy anyway. And you realize, my God, I, I'm a victim. Why? Well, my intention was, uh, you know, good job, health, uh, relationship. That was my intention. And it never showed up. So, Rec just being, just put yourself in that position. You're looking out of your eyes. You're looking at the world. It doesn't match your wishes and desires. And you were the one that had very specific wishes and desires. And it doesn't match. Where does that leave a person? And here's where the problem is. It makes us believe that we are victims of the world. That the nature isn't supporting us. Life is not in our favor. Why? I wanted this. It never happened. And therefore, the universe is not supporting me. And I go, oh my God, this is so problematic for this reason. It's our own invisible behavior that we play 95% of the day that is sabotaging our destination. It's the autopilot that's taking us on the wrong course. And, and it becomes relevant because if you understand this, you can rewrite the program. And I say, well, what happens if you just stop playing the program? Well, I mentioned when you fall in love, you become mindful, which it technically means you keep your conscious mind present. You don't go in and think. I mean, if you just found this person you've been looking for your whole life and they're right there in front of you, this is not the time to think. This is time to be present and enjoy it. So when you fall in love, you stay present, point. You didn't default to the subconscious while you were in love like that. And all of a sudden I say, well, then your life is being controlled by your conscious. I go, yeah, that's the brain with wishes and desires. And all of a sudden you say, oh my God, the honeymoon was wishes and desires made manifest. I go, that's because you stopped playing the program. You could have that every day if you didn't. Not, you know, if you just stop playing the program. Uh, and, and then you say at some point, well, the honeymoon is great. But it doesn't last forever. Some people, it's really short, maybe a week or two or a month where this bliss is happening and then things seem to go back to normal life. I go, the reason is simple. You, at first, when you fall in love, you stay mindful, you stay present. Thinking is not relevant. Being is what's relevant at that time. Being there and enjoying and experiencing and driving your vehicle towards your wishes and desires, that's really great. But inevitably, over time, look, we still have jobs. We have to take care of chores. We have things we have to do. We have committees and meetings or whatever it is. I go, relevance, the moment 
these things start backing up and you start thinking about them is the moment you start defaulting to the subconscious. The point is you haven't played subconscious until you started thinking. I say, but the honeymoon, you weren't playing subconscious. You were creating with that conscious mind, which is fabulous. You made the heaven on earth. But as you start thinking, all of a sudden, the subconscious starts defaulting, and these behaviors, not your behaviors, the behaviors you were programmed with, most of them negative, start manifesting. But then again, go back to the story of Bill. Yes, you're thinking about the job and all this kind of stuff. Your behavior starts manifesting from the subconscious, which had some bad programming in it. Your partner you have this honeymoon with sees the behavior coming out of you, like Bill. You're behaving like your father, and yet you're the one that doesn't see it. And that's when the honeymoon starts to break down. Because your partner sees his behavior and says, what kind of behavior is this? Who are you? And then you are going, I don't know what you're talking about. And that's true. Because the behavior that played, played when you were, you know, your conscious was busy. And as more and more subconscious programs showing up, because we start thinking more and more, the subconscious programs sabotage relationships. And that's what causes the honeymoon to disappear. And if the programs are very, very bad, it obviously leads to a disconnection uh, uh, in the relationship. And all of it from doing what? Behavior that you haven't even seen. <laughs> it's just automatically playing and sabotaging you. And because it's invisible, you perceive yourself as the victim. So you're saying presence is the key to experiencing the honeymoon effect and experiencing heaven on earth every day? Absolutely. Now, it's very difficult to stay present because I said, how many demands do we have on taking care of your life? You know, from salaries to chores to jobs to whatever it is. The moment you start thinking is the moment you start automatically playing those programs. Now, staying mindful is an exercise, but it's very difficult to do. And therefore, uh, it doesn't sound like, oh my God, there's not a lot of hope because trying to stay mindful is very difficult in a world where so much thinking is required. And then I say, okay, resolution. Resolution is this. You can reprogram the subconscious. And if you rewrite the negative programs by putting in more positive programs right over them, then 95% of the day when your subconscious is being on automatic, rather than sabotaging yourself, if you had good programs that support your wishes and desires, you would unconsciously be moving toward wishes and desires with no effort because you've been controlled by the unconscious anyway, without any effort anyway. All the problems are the programs that you are generally playing are not empowering and, and in fact, more self-sabotaging, in fact. Uh, and, and this is where the issues come from. So the idea is if you can reprogram it, then you have power over the destiny of your life because you can program your wishes and desires as behaviors uh, into your mind. And what will happen is 95% of the day, this these automatic programs will be taking you to the positive side of our, our world rather than compromising uh, our lives with uh, negative behaviors that are, you know, uh, not visible and self-sabotaging. Mm. This is exactly what I talk about in my first book, Mastering Your Mean Girl, which is basically a practical guide for women to master those limiting negative fear-based beliefs in their mind. Now, everything you're saying, I totally resonates with me, but for someone who's sitting here going, holy moly, I have all of these limiting beliefs in my mind. I have played the victim for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. How do I reprogram? I have a three-step mastering your mean girl process, but I would love to hear how do we reprogram these limiting fear-based beliefs so that we can experience the honeymoon effect and heaven on earth every single day. 
every single day. And that's a true story. At least as far as I know, it's been that way for 20 years, 21 years for me. Uh, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but at least a 21 year run of a honeymoon, I think is really a worthwhile uh, end product from understanding uh, how to reprogram this subconscious because that's what it's all based on. Uh, the first thing is this, what are the programs? <laughs> and I, and why this becomes so problematic is, listen, you were being programmed starting in the last trimester of pregnancy through the first seven years. So, I mean, a, a, a fetus can uh, learn uh, music if, if the mother plays uh, music near the abdomen, replay, you know, plays the same song over and over again. When the fetus be, is born, the, the new baby will recognize the music instantly because it learned it even in the womb. Uh, if the father talks through the abdominal wall to the fetus when the baby is born and the father speaks the fetus, the baby now will, will identify who the father is instantly, just instantly from the voice recognition. So learning starts in the last trimester of pregnancy and goes through the first seven years. And then it becomes problematic in this way. Okay. So what program did you get when you were zero? Oh, you, you don't remember. Oh, okay. How about when you were one? Oh, you don't remember that one either. How about two? And all of a sudden you start to realize the maximum amount of programming, period, you were totally unaware of the program. This makes an issue for this reason. What are the programs? You weren't there. Conscious mind didn't kick in. Your identity mind didn't kick in until age seven. You were programmed before age seven. What are the programs? Well, Let's make life so easy <laughs> because it does not require going to a shrink and, and, and going to a psychologist and talking about who did what the who. That actually uh, frequently can take you away from your destination, replaying the old hurts and wounds. Uh, uh, it's sort of like killing the messenger over the message. I don't care who did what to who. What's really important is how did you respond? What did you, what behavior did you take on in response to interactions? So you want to know your behavior. I go, yeah, uh, I don't care who created the behavior. You want to know what your behavior is. So here's simplification point, big one. 95% of your life is coming from the subconscious programs. Point is simple. Look at your life and recognize this. Everything that you like that comes easily into your life is there because somewhere there's a program to acknowledge that this is good for me, okay? But then here's the one I want you to pay attention to. Anything you work hard over, anything you struggle over, anything you put a lot of effort into making happen, anything you have to sweat over to get it off the ground, why are you working so hard? Inevitably, the answer is that destination is not supported by the subconscious programs. So all of a sudden it says, well, then look at your life and find where's the struggle, where's the part that you want to go and it's not going there and you're working really hard. I say, inevitably, that destination is not supported by your program. So you know what you want. Let's say, you know, it's just simple. Let's say one of the things that's most important that people don't recognize, and I've seen it because I've been involved with a, a number of uh, uh, workshops where belief change modifications are, are brought into the workshop. Uh, one of the things that turned out to be very interesting is from 85 to 90 percent of all attendees, when tested for the belief, I love myself, 85 to 90 percent of the people, their subconscious would not support that. And you go, well, that's interesting. I think, that's more than interesting. That's a, automatically, <laughs> if you can't love yourself, how can you be loved? I mean, just logic at this point, because you're critical of yourself. You say, well, look, I don't love myself for X, Y, and Z. These are things that my parents probably, uh, you know, programmed into me in the first seven years, not deserving, not lovable, not smart enough, not pretty enough, whatever kinds of programs that were downloaded in that seven years, they're working 95% of the day. And therefore, if you can't love yourself, and that's the big issue, because we've been so criticized as children, that we become self-critical. And if you're self-critical and you say, I could give you a list of reasons why I'm not lovable, then you have to recognize this. Then if anybody comes into your life and says they love you, you're going to be very skeptical of that claim because you can say, how can you love me? I don't love me. And this is the largest part of the population. So seeking happiness in this world is really predicated on loving yourself. So one of the first things I always test for is I love myself. 
And, and if you don't test positive, that, that's the first thing that has to be fixed. And you say, well, how do you fix it? Oh, Lipton's finally coming around to talk about how you fix it. Okay, here's how we fix it. The conscious mind and the subconscious mind are different in regard to function. The conscious mind is creative, connected to your spiritual identity. You, your identity is in the conscious mind. The subconscious mind is a record playback device. It records programs that become habits. You push the button and the program will play for the rest of your life. You learned how to walk when you were two. You're still walking using the same program. Okay? So the functions are different. Conscious mind's creative. Subconscious mind, habitual. Learning is different. And this is where the problems come from. Conscious mind is creative. That means any way you can put information in, the conscious mind can absorb it and go, yeah, yeah. Read a self-help book. Get a hundred on a test. Did you understand the book? You get a hundred. Conscious mind understood the book. The point. The conscious, the subconscious didn't learn from that book reading because that's not how the subconscious learns. So going to lectures, uh, listening to podcasts, uh, self-help books, all these exercises, they're really great. And the conscious mind readily downloads them because the conscious mind being creative, uh, you can just go, aha, and, and a new thought could be downloaded into the conscious mind. The point about it is this, is that the subconscious mind does not learn that way, and that's where the problem comes from. The subconscious mind learns two principal ways naturally. First seven years, hypnosis. When the brain is in theta, hypnosis is occurring. And whatever you hear is bypassing consciousness and going straight into the subconscious program. So you can say, well, do I have to go see a, a hypnotherapist? I go, no. Good reason. Why? Because every night when you come home from work, your EEG, your brain activity is at a high vibration at work, beta. When you come home and you start to cool out and calm down for the evening, the vibration is lower to a frequency called alpha, calm consciousness. Just as you are about to tip off into sleep where consciousness is just letting go, then you move into a lower vibration called theta. Well, theta, that was the vibration in the first seven years. That's hypnosis. So basically it says... If you put earphones on and play a program uh, that you want to have in your life, wishes and desires, whatever that program is that will support your wishes and desires, every night as you go to bed, you just put the earphones on. As soon as your conscious mind checks out, the pathway straight to the subconscious is open via theta, and whatever is on the tape can automatically program new behavior. So you can program uh, new behavior using hypnosis uh, and auto-hypnosis, as I said. It's just uh, putting earphones on at night and putting on a tape that plays a program uh, of wishes and desires that you would like to have in your life. Uh, number two, theta hypnosis lasts until age seven. After age seven, the subconscious mind uses a different way of learning. After age seven, it's based on repetition, practice, habituation, repeating things over and over again. Like when you uh, uh, learned how to do the ABCs, uh, how many times did you have to start and, and not end and have to start over again and over again until you can go from A to Z without making a mistake? Point was, once you got to A to Z, you were done. You never had to repeat it again. Now it's learned. You repeated it, repeated it, and then you learned it. Driving a car. You didn't know how to drive a car when you first sat in and put the key in the ignition. You had to practice. Ah, practice, repetition, learning. It's a learning curve. I say, ah, after age seven, you can rewrite the subconscious using habituation, making a practice that is repetitive over and over again. And the relevance about that is, a wonderful, uh, humorous, and exacting phrase is, fake it till you make it. Meaning, if you're not happy, but every day you repeat, every day it's habit. It's not a sticky note on the refrigerator. Sticky note, those are suggestions. Habit is something that you have to do repetitively. So if you're repeating during the day, I am happy, I am happy, I am happy, during the day, different times, repetition. There's a point where repetition, the subconscious is going to learn, I am happy. He goes, so is, is that going to make me happy? I go, yes, for this reason. And I didn't say it before, but here's what the reason is. The function of the mind is to make coherence between our beliefs and our reality.
I'll say it again. It is a critical, most important phrase. The function of the mind is to create coherence between our beliefs and our reality. And as a result of that, our lives seem normal at some point, whatever happens that's good or bad, and we go, oh yeah, that's normal. Why? Because whatever we had a belief, and it's unfolding in front of you, and it's like, yeah, that I, that's the way life is. That's the way I expect it. I go, that was a program. And you can change these programs, but you have to change them either via uh, hypnosis, auto hypnosis with tapes, uh, or through repetition. And once you put in a new belief, let's say I put a belief uh, that uh, um, I am happy. And right now your life's not happy at all. But every day you say, I am happy. I am happy. There's a number of days where that habit will then be programmed into the subconscious. And I say, then what? And I guess what? You'll start to be happy without you even saying I'm happy. Why? Because the mind has learned that program happy is what you're seeking. And the function of the mind is to make your life match the program. So unconsciously, you will end up being happy without even knowing why. Because you have a program. You have programs now, but they may not be taking you to the positive side. But if you rewrite the programs, then you have an opportunity to have a completely different life. Just think about it this way. If you took the wishes and desires that you expressed in the honeymoon and reprogrammed your subconscious mind to accept those wishes and desires as a program, the answer is beautiful, and that is you will have a honeymoon for the rest of your life if you're thinking about it or you're not thinking about it because automatic subconscious behavior, autopilot, will assure you of that honeymoon. But you have to get it into the subconscious. So the two fundamental ways of natural uh, subconscious programming, hypnosis, which is the first seven years of your life, followed by repetition, which happens after age seven. Now, these take time. Because it's reprogramming. It's a reprogramming. It's a habituation. you got to take some time with this, okay? However, there's a whole new field called energy psychology. And energy psychology have different modalities where you can rewrite subconscious beliefs in minutes. And that's like, what? I'm saying absolutely, 100% even scientifically visible by uh, recording electrical activity of a human brain when they're using some of these practices to change beliefs. Even a person who can't read the EEG, all the squiggly lines, can see the moment the new belief kicks in, there's a profound change in the pattern. And, and so what's the point? It's not new agey ideas about these rapid belief change processes because we now have neurological data to reveal that, in fact, there is a, a, an organic brain change in putting in a new program. And there are many of these modalities. They involve something like super learning. You go, what's super learning? I go, well, super learning is like if you go into a bookstore and you see somebody reading a book by moving their finger down the page, and as fast as they swipe the finger down the page, they read every word. So they can <clears throat> stand in the bookstore in a matter of minutes, flipping page, 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 read an entire book. That's super learning. If you engage super learning practices in belief change modification, you can download new beliefs in minutes. Five, 10 minutes, a belief that's affected your whole life, 50 years, you can change that. There are a variety of, the, of these modalities uh, on my website, which is really simple, brucelipton.com. There are, I think, up to 30 different modalities of uh, belief change modifications where beliefs can be changed uh, in record short time. Uh, this is really important because all you have to do is look at your life, and if it's not working right, Install a belief that will match your destination, your wish, your desire. Install a belief as if you already had it. And I say, why? Well, if you already say, I am happy and you're not, what's the job of the mind? To make you happy. If you're looking for X and you don't have X, the job of the mind is to secure X for you. So when you put in these programs, you can rewrite the entire character of your health and happiness and harmony on this planet. This is so great. I am just loving it so much. It really resonates 
I do a lot of repetition, uh, a lot whilst I'm driving. I, I have two of my favorite things to repeat are, I love you and thank you. And I just say them over and over and over in my mind whilst I'm driving. I don't listen to anything. I'll just say those or when I'm walking or just any moment I catch myself throughout the day. I'm constantly repeating, I love you, thank you, I love you, thank you. And I cannot tell you how much it has helped me experience heaven on earth. How do you define heaven on earth? Because it's going to be different for everyone. So what is your definition of heaven on earth or or the honeymoon effect? The definition I see, and you're absolutely right, this is why the honeymoon, you say, or heaven. You say, you know, what is heaven? And as you mentioned, well, you can ask 10 people and get 10 totally different answers because heaven to an individual is something that matches what they think is harmonious with their life, what they like. Uh, I remember a funny joke. The guy said, uh, he was talking to somebody, he says, what's your vision of heaven? And the guy says, I'm a duck hunter. I would love to have a heaven where I go out every day and go hunt ducks. (laughs) And the, the guy said, oh, Oh, you, I guess your version of heaven is the duck's version of hell. <laughs> so it basically is um, our behaviors and our desires are projected. And uh, if our behaviors are not in harmony with our desires, then we struggle. But the idea of then what is your desire, that's what you put out in front of you. What is it you want? That's basically the a really hard question. What is it you want? You ask somebody, and it's like, well, I want to be happy. I go, well, that, that's nice, but what is it that, you know, that gives you happy? What is it? You know, it's not, that's a feeling. I want to know what it is that you want that will result in you getting happy. And all of a sudden, you realize it's not so easy to define for a lot of people. So that becomes very critical because if you want to reprogram your system, the whole idea is you got to put a belief in there that uh, uh, is a destination belief. This is what I want, Uh, but it has to be put in as if it's already happened, meaning uh, if you're not healthy and you say, uh, uh, I want to program, I am healthy. I go, yeah, but, you know, I could look at you. I say, yeah, you don't look healthy. I say, no, I'm putting in a program. I am healthy. I'm repeating this. I say, Why? Because once the subconscious gets a program, I am healthy, and, and the subconscious reviews, looks at your physiology and goes, no, you're not, then the function of the subconscious is to adjust your physiology to manifest health again. So you have to put in a belief as if it's already happened. And then the function of the subconscious mind is to take that belief and manifest it so that it does happen. So you can't. You can't put in a belief, oh, I want to be successful. I want to be healthy. Uh, you know, I wish for this. I desire that. I go, because if you record those statements, let's say, I want to be healthy. And I say, okay, record it today. Come back in a year. I say, let's hear the recording. I want to be healthy. I say, wow, the whole year's gone by. And you can't get to healthy because you didn't say, I am healthy. You're on the way to being healthy. I want to be healthy. It's not healthy. It's on the way. So all of a sudden you realize, boy, you have to be very critical about the programs you put in. It has to be as if you had what you wanted right now, in spite of the fact that it's quite obvious you don't have it. Because once the brain puts in the mission, then the subconscious's job is to pursue that program to manifest it and make it real. And so that is the real critical part about putting a program into the system because it sounds kind of stupid. You could be dying of cancer and then somebody hears you going, I am healthy. I am healthy. And it's like, to them, it's like, wow, that doesn't fit. And I go, yeah, and it doesn't fit to the subconscious mind until it's in there. And once the subconscious mind is in there, then a spontaneous remission can manifest itself. Mm, And this is the whole fake it till you make it. Absolutely. There's an element of that, and that's exactly what I say in my work. It's like, just start repeating these I am statements and do it every day as many times as you possibly can, and your subconscious mind will start to believe it. Absolutely. That is, and it's funny because basically it's very simple, and yet, Look, humans make everything complex, and and that's why we have trouble understanding nature. Nature is a basically simple mechanism, and yet when you lay on top of a human complexity of looking at it, it gets too complex to understand it at some point. And the idea about it is life is simple. All you really need to do is say, I want to program this. 
And then you say whatever that program is, and you can put it in through repetition, you could put it in through hypnosis, or using uh, one of these energy psychology modalities. Uh, as I said, I got about 30 of them listed on the website. Uh, so uh, there are many different choices uh, of which one you might be interested in doing. But I know from experience, several of them uh, have been uh, verified using neuro uh, testing, actually, uh, um, you know, recording of uh, brain function using uh, quantif quantum uh, EEG, it's called, where you can get whole brain function from EEG. Uh, these technologies have revealed that the, some of these uh, belief change modification processes are not just a new age idea but are actually scientifically valid. And that's really cool because uh, my whole life has personally changed before I even knew the science was valid. Even if it was a new idea, God, it works really great. And uh, But now I also know it's not a new age idea. It is a mechanism, and it, it works beautifully. Let's talk now about the way our beliefs affect our genes. This is something that I am incredibly interested in. And if we, you know, look at a common example, let's say we went or I went out and I got my genes tested and it said that I had a high risk of a certain type of cancer or other disease. What are your thoughts on how our beliefs affect our genes? Well, right away, I would have to say that would be the worst uh, response you can get because once somebody in a so-called scientific white jacket says, look, we looked at your genes and you have genes for this negative and negative and negative. This becomes conscious where it wasn't conscious before. And once it becomes conscious, and if you don't love yourself or if you have other issues about self-worth and value and all that from growing up, uh, just that knowledge alone can cause a disease that would never have happened. It's very important. People think that because the public has been programmed to believe that a gene is a program and that's it. You got the gene, you got the program, and that's it. So, for example, we talk about uh, Angelina Jolie has the BRCA1 gene, breast cancer gene. Her mother died of the breast cancer and her grandmother, I think, died. Uh, and her father was a doctor, I think, and they encouraged her to have a double mastectomy. Why? Because she has the gene. And I go, wait a minute. Does having the gene mean you get the disease? And the answer is absolutely not. 50% of the women that have the BRCA1 gene will never get the cancer. So the point is, wait, the gene didn't cause cancer. Yeah, but if you get a gene readout and somebody says, oh my God, you got the BRCA1 gene, immediately your consciousness will focus on the negative output of that. And once the consciousness plays that in your mind over and over again, because you start to worry about it, uh, and worrying is I, a quote that I read that was really cool, worrying is praying for something you don't want. If you worry about a cancer, you can manifest a cancer because the brain will take a program and manifest it, whatever it is. So do gene cards really help. And I say, only if you have one of, I think, seven diseases that a single gene could cause, such as uh, Tay-Sachs disease or hemophilia or cerebral palsy. If those are running in your family, checking a gene would be very helpful. But in regard to everything else, including cancer, it's not a single gene process. It's many genes involved. Just to get a cancer off the ground starts with a minimum of 12 genes coactively working together to make it, uh, and then leads to maybe 100 or 200 different genes that are activated into cancer. So what's the point? It's not single genes. So if you look at a gene, you say, oh, you've got that gene. I said, only in seven diseases does that make any difference. If it's not one of the, you don't have the seven diseases, then any suggestion that somebody reads your genes becomes a negative, usually a very negative uh, idea that they're seeding you with. Oh my God, Melissa, you have this gene, you know, that could lead to this cancer. And all of a sudden I say, now where's your consciousness? It's, oh my God, I got a gene that can cause cancer. All you have to be is not in harmony with your life and cancer will be a manifestation from that point on. We can create any disease as much as um, placebo thinking, positive thinking, can cancel any disease. Nocebo, negative thinking, the negative side, can create any disease. You have a fear of cancer, you can manifest it. So the point is very important. You're going to get a gene readout, and they're going to suggest that these are your futures. And I go, I can make, no, you can make, it's not each of us, <laughs> um, using the process called epigenetics, 
it's how the environment interfaces the genetic code. Um, how the environment interfaces it, uh, you can, let's say, of a single gene, I could say, uh, and a gene makes a protein. It's a building block of the body. And of course, if the genes are good, then the proteins are good and your body runs like a machine with good proteins. And if the gene is defective, the protein is defective and that could interfere with the function in the body. And I go, okay, wait, now uh, I can have a gene, which is a blueprint. And here's the most important fact, that how I respond to the environment, I could modify the readout of that single gene to make over 3,000 variations of proteins from the same blueprint based on how I respond to the world. And all of a sudden, oh my God, the genes aren't read-only programs. You got the gene, you got the program. The genes are read-write programs. Based on how you carry out your life, your beliefs, your behaviors, your stresses, your love, uh, all these are influences that will determine whether a gene is going to be activated in a positive way or a negative way. So in other words, you can have the BRCA1 gene, but if your life is in harmony and all that, that gene will never be activated. And I said, when is it activated? I said, when you're in stress. Ah, so the idea was the gene didn't cause cancer, it's stress. And it turns out, in fact, I think 90% of disease is now stress-related. And basically it says, well, but stress is something we should be able to control. And I go, yes. And all of a sudden I say, if you understand stress and you can control it, you will avoid being part of uh, that population. 90% uh, uh, of disease uh, is the result of their stress. And, and so we have to stop looking at genes being uh, a, a printout of our lives. So like you got a program, here's your gene program, this is your life. I go, BS, that, that means belief system. That's a bunch of BS for this simple reason. Every gene can be modified to be either enhance its ability or take away its ability based on how you are responding to the environment. That is what epigenetics is about. Genetics, the old science is, this is your gene, this is your life. Epigenetics, a new science is, how you respond to life will determine the character of your genetic readout. And all of a sudden it says, well, then you're not locked into anything until you carry out certain kinds of behaviors. And that means then you're free to, your genes are not going to determine who you are. You can create anything. Uh, and this is the freedom that epigenetics offers as compared to the more conventional science called genetics, which is flawed. Uh, the genetic science says genes will determine the character of your life. Epigenetics, you determine the character of your genes as an empowerment right there. Yes, I feel so empowered. I am so excited. Like this just makes me fist pump. I'm just so excited because we are the ones in the driver's seat and it really brings back all the power to ourselves and we are the ones that can create heaven on earth, whatever that looks like for us and experience this amazing honeymoon effect every day if that's what we truly wish. So, yes, Bruce, yes. <laughs> yes, I, and it's so exciting because in the bottom line, understanding the nature of all this biology I came to my own little uh, vision of what I think is the greatest cosmic joke in the world. And that is, we have been programmed by people that if you have a good life and you die, you can go to heaven. My understanding of this new science and the role of epigenetics and the role of identity and spirituality as part of the science, which I saw uh, in the nature of how the cells work, uh, I saw that my identity is like a broadcast in the field and my body is like a remote control vehicle. And when my identity connects with my body, I'm the one that can drive the vehicle around. And what is really fun for me because the first moment, look, I wasn't spiritual 40 plus years of my life. Uh, and there was this moment when I was understanding the mechanism of epigenetics, how the environment was controlling the biology that I saw, oh my God, each of us has a unique identity. That's why we can't exchange organs and cells with each other. Because if you put your cells into my body, my immune system will say not self and reject it. I put my cells into your body, your immune system will say not self and reject it. Point is simple. Our cells have identity. <laughs> my cells have a different identity than yours. And it turns out the identity 
is due to a set of antennas, just like miniature television antennas on the surface of the cell. No two people have the same set of antennas. And these receptors, they're called self-receptors, interesting name, receivers of self, receive an identity from the environment, like a broadcast. And when I started to recognize that, I said, oh my God, I exist as a broadcast separate from my existence as a physical body because I related to like watching a television. You're, you're watching a show on television. The television breaks. Oh, television is dead. I go, yeah, no more show. Things broken, dead. But the question is, is the broadcast still on? And the answer is, of course. Get another TV, plug it in, turn it on, and then tune it to the right identity station, and the show is back on air again. That's called reincarnation. And I realized, oh my God, we come and go, the bodies come and go, uh, and but we're spirits, we're broadcast, we're energy. It's a field in quantum physics, it's a field. And I go, the first moment this hit me, I said, wow, I'm, I'm the field playing through my body. And I said to myself, well, Bruce, uh, why have a spirit and a body? Why not just be the spirit? Uh, and, and my life changed with the humor of 50 trillion cells that make up the community called my body. I asked the question, why have a spirit and a body? And 50 trillion cells, I could feel it welled up inside of me and came right up to my head and said, Bruce, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? <laughs> and all of a sudden I said, oh my God, when we step into the body, the physical body translates the environment based on our receptors. Eyes look at the energy and see a landscape, okay? Uh, the nose smells the roses. That's an, a vibration in the field. These are vibrations. And the body is converting those vibrations into sensation. And our uh, body is sending that back to our source. Our source is like... The analogy I give people is, look, we can't go to Mars. We want to know what Mars is all about. What would, what would it be like to live on Mars? I say, well, we send up something called the Mars Rover. It looks like a go-kart with a lot of antennas and cameras and stuff on it. I go, that's the equivalent of a human because we, we can't get the human there. So I send up the machine. I say, oh, yeah, but it's the equivalent of a human for this reason. It's got eyes to see with. It's got temperature sensors to read what the atmosphere is all about, oxygen reading. It could taste the soil and see what chemistry is in there. So how does it work? The guy at NASA sends a signal to the Mars rover and drives it around. As the sensors on the rover pick up information, they send it back through the same antenna to the guy at NASA. So the guy at NASA can have an experience of what it would be like to be on Mars. Here's what the temperature would be like. This is what the air would be like. And so I say, yeah. And I say, how's it work? I say, well, the rover, the Mars rover is reading the environment. It's being driven by the guy at NASA. But in response to moving around the environment, it sends information back to the guy at NASA. And now I want to make the simple conclusion. We are Earth rovers. We came here to move around these vehicles, drive them around and do creation, and then take the sensory responses back to source. What does chocolate taste like? What does a rose smell like? What does a sunset look like? What does being in love feel like? These are the results of the chemistry of our body. But all the nervous system does is take that and break all those sensory inputs down into a vibration. That I said, you can read these vibrations with a probe outside of your head called magnetoencephalograph. In other words, we're like the Earth rover, and our experiences are being broadcast back to source that you can put a probe out there and read the broadcast. So I say, well, so what's the biggest cosmic joke in my life? It's like, oh my God, I don't think you die and go to heaven. I think you are born into heaven. And I think that's why we're here, to create. I say, what's heaven? Whatever the heck you want to create. And then you look and you say, yeah, but if this is heaven, why does it look so scary and so much problems and all the negative stuff and all that? And I go, that's because you're not creating from your belief system. You're creating from the programs. And we perpetuate these programs from generation to generation to generation. And we disempower ourselves. And yet, the moment we fall in love, let go of the program, the creation turns into something so much more beautiful and blissful and so much healthier because we turn it into heaven. That was our destination. So my joke is, 
uh, don't wait till you die to go to heaven. This is where you created it. This is where you create anything you want. Put it in your mind and create it. And if you don't like the creation you have, reprogram it and do another creation. So in the end, welcome to the matrix. I agree. I just think, you know, every day I, I wake up and I'm so grateful to experience another day. And I truly live in heaven on earth. I live in the, the most beautiful place on the beach. And I'm just so grateful for my inner and outer reality. So I love what you're saying. And I've got a couple more questions. I would love to know if there's something that you're currently working on or would like to improve within yourself at the moment. I'm not working on improving my life at this moment because I'm loving my life at this moment. And, uh, and as you have experienced, once you start living it in that creative way, then you manifest what you're looking for. So uh, like yourself, I, I live on a mountain up in the forest with redwood trees above the sea. Uh, and, and it's not an accident. Uh, I, I ended up here. There was a, you know, a direction and a belief and all that. So do I need to change that? And the answer is no. But what I'd like to do is continue to get the public to be more aware that we're facing an evolutionary upheaval that when they see the things falling apart, that this is not a negative thing at all. This is the most positive thing that could happen to this planet. I mean, with Trump uh, destroying the U.S., that, that's great leadership. Why? Because we cannot thrive into the future with the current culture for a simple reason. The culture that is manifested on this planet right now is responsible for causing what is called the sixth mass extinction of life on this planet. Five times in the history of this planet, life was thriving, and then from 70 to 90% of life got wiped out because of some catastrophic event. Uh, the dinosaurs got lost, what, some 60 million years ago when an asteroid hit the planet that was so big it upset the ecology of the entire planet, wiping out 70 to 90% of life. Uh, it's happened five times in history. Today, we are losing species faster than in previous mass extinctions. And unfortunately, science has identified the cause, and it's human behavior. The way we are destroying the environment that supports us, we're undermining our lives. So we have to change our behavior. And that means change culture. The way we are living is not sustainable. It'll take one and a half planet Earths just to provide for the people that are here to today to their needs. And we don't have it, obviously. We're facing extinction. The only way out is to change our behavior, break the culture down. So as you see around the world, global catastrophes of every kind, from political, religious, economic, uh, climate change, healthcare crises, all of these, I say, yes, this, these are part of the unsettling, the breaking of a system that is not supportive. And it's really important because if it doesn't break down, Extinction is not 1,000 years from now. We're talking uh, like no fish in the ocean by 2048. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, that's like science fiction. But it's like, well, in 20 years, that's where it's going to be. No fish. And humans will get lost early in the game. So uh, we're talking decades uh, of upheaval and loss of, of human life if we do not change our behavior and live in a different way. So my message for people is to recognize when you see things falling apart, this is the most positive aspect of our future. The reason is we cannot stay, sustain ourselves on the current situation. And therefore, we need to level it and build a culture that is more in harmony with nature so we can thrive into the future. So that means the old system has to come down. A new system will emerge. And, uh, and there I sit in this country watching Donald Trump destroy the United States faster than I could have ever imagined anybody could do it. Uh, and I look at it with, you know, two sides of my head, one going, oh, crap, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. And the other side says, oh, good, uh, because as we bring it to an end, we could build something better. Mm, I agree. Wow. So powerful, hey? It's um of I think it's Tony Robbins who says sometimes we have to have the breakdowns to have the breakthroughs. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and it, and it's true. So you have a choice. Focus on the breakdowns, 
but that'll suck the energy out of you. It really drains you of life to focus on this negative breakdown when we should be redirecting our thoughts, our energy, our attitudes, beliefs toward building something outside of the box, building something better. Uh, not not being involved with trying to support the thing that's falling down. The thing that's falling down has to fall down. If we keep propping it up, we're just going to move into extinction even faster. So it's basically like you, myself, and others on this line. Once we start taking back our power, we step out of the structure and build something better. And that's when people begin to realize, oh my God, you know, you can build something, you can build a beautiful life, but you have to let go of the old belief system. Love that so much. So let's pretend now that you have a magic wand and you can put one book in the school curriculum of every single high school around the world. Let's pretend your books are already in the curriculum. Is there another book that you would put in the school curriculum for high school students around the entire world? I think that I I love the book Conversations with God. And I think that that really brings God to another level of communication instead of this exalted high and mighty sitting on some throne. There's a character to God. And each one of us, uh, I I perceive as a piece of God, because as I said, each one of us receives a different band of vibrational frequencies. We're all in the human band of frequencies. It's like a giant radio where you can turn the dial and go down and pick up one station after the other. Well, the human band, we could have, you know, right now, seven and a half billion stations on it. But the point about it is, who are we? And the answer is, we're part of the of the whole, all that is. We're a part of God. Each one of us is a creator in our own right. And, and the idea of recognizing is once we recognize we're creators and not victims, there's the opportunity to change the world. But then you can't look at God as some distant you know, illusion of some powerful being when you recognize all of us are a piece of God. And when we recognize the unity of all people, then the light will be on this planet, uh, the, the white light that people talk about. It's not an individual. It's all of us coming together and recognizing each one of us as a creator. And if we collectively create in harmony, we can change the world overnight. So it's basically a call to consciousness that we're facing right now. I love that book. I've actually had Neil Donald Walsh uh, on the show, which was just amazing. He's a wonderful human, a wonderful human. I love him. He's beautiful. Now, let's talk about how your day looks. Uh, Do you have a morning routine or I love hearing about how people prime themselves for the day or any sort of little routines that you do? Do you have anything? Well, unfortunately, the first thing is I have to turn on my computer and deal with a a rush of emails that accumulates while I sleep. (laughs) And I can't can't keep up with it, sort of like the post office. As many as I try to deal with it, more keeps coming in. So I'm not real happy with that part about it, but I want to keep present. It's necessary for me to keep my, my... you know, hand on the pulse of what's going on and being communicative with everybody that I possibly can. Uh, The reason is because uh, this is a mission. And I say, well, what's the mission? I say, well, when I learn about my life and I learned about my programming and I learned how to rewrite the programs and end up where I am today, happy and healthy and enjoying life and living heaven on earth, I, I was so grateful that I that I really just said to the universe, I said, well, if you want me to go and talk about this, uh, okay, anytime. Well, ever since I said that, my lecture schedule's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, and I love it because waking people up is a great joy. Waking people up to show them, you're not victims, you're creators, you're extremely powerful, uh, and giving them that 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 little edge. Because when people awaken and they start to glow, they, they experience love, they experience harmony, beauty. That's what we have available to us. And as I said, uh, the honeymoon is a, a short example of that, but that's available every day. And since I've enjoyed it for 20 plus years, my mission is to go out and find as many other people that want to hear this story because if they begin to enjoy their lives and everyone around me is starting to live in harmony and joy and love and peace, and guess what? I'm surrounded by love, and that's a wonderful place to be in this world. And the way to do that is to get as many people to wake up as possible. 
Mm-hmm. I agree. It's fun, isn't it? It is. So in your opinion now, what is one of the most important things that we can do today for our health? Just one quick, simple thing that we could do. <laughs> one of our first thing is treat yourself like you treat your pet. <laughs> People have a great tendency to do everything, bend over backwards for the health of their pet and take care of them and walk the pet and everything. It's like, no, you go out and walk. <laughs> you know, you uh, we have to treat our bodies as as an understanding. It's a device that we were given, and if we learn how to operate it. Uh, we can sustain it and, and make it run perfectly. I mean, think about it this way. Uh, cars come off an assembly line. I say two cars almost identical come off the assembly line and one goes to a young kid and the other goes to a mature person. I say, which one of these cars is going to be on the road the longest? And the answer is quite obvious. The the one who treats the car with respect and takes care of it and services and you know takes care of it, that car lasts a long time. A teenager, hothead, emotional, up and down, uh, will, will, that car will be in the junkyard. Bodies are like cars. If we take care of them, they last a long time, and they should last a minimum of 140 years as an average lifespan, minimum. But we uh, are living in so many stressors that we are compromising that, that opportunity. So the, the basic idea is to recognize we have, we've had these programs, and all they've done is disempower us, basically. And that by taking charge of your program, then people can live like you, Melissa, beautiful woman you are, and the world that you're creating is not an accident. That's a creation. And, and everybody can have a creation they like, but they just have to wake up to the fact they have been programmed and it's invisible. And that's why it's the hardest thing to say, hey, you've been programmed. They go, I don't, I don't see it. And I go, that's the program. <laughs> that's why you don't see it. How do we not allow our programming to go on to our children? I have an 11-year-old stepson and and maybe I'll have you know my own children one day, but if that was the case, how would I not let them have my programming? How do I do that? Well, the first thing is this, is uh, if you have good programming, why not let your kids have that programming? That's the whole idea. If parents were actually representatives of the world that we want, then children would automatically grow up creating the world that we want. So the idea is what we have to do is fix our behavior and when our behavior is adjusted, rewritten, and we're living in harmony, that is a then we become uh, the you know what is looked at by a child, and, and through hypnosis, observing our behavior, and it becomes theirs. So rather than fixing a child, the first thing is fix ourselves. And once we're fixed, then the children around us will automatically pick up on the new us, the better, more powerful, loving us. Uh, so it's not that I want to disconnect. Uh, it's just basically, though, I need to understand that if I haven't rewritten my programs, I might have some very negative programs. And I say, when will they show up? I say, when you're not even observing them. But everybody else will see it, sort of like everybody else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. It's just Bill that doesn't see it. Well, everyone around us, our children and our, our community around us, sees our unconscious behavior. And, and if we don't see it, th- that's a problem because it could be very self-destructive. So the most important aspect in this regard is to recognize that parents as a couple, understanding what we've been talking about, that a lot of the behavior, especially the negative stuff, is not coming from our conscious, uh, who we are, our spirit. It's coming from a program. When people understand that in a relationship, instead of getting into arguments and, and crisis, when behaviors that show up that are not any good are brought to the attention, not in a negative way, but in an opportunity to say, well, you know, you may want to change this behavior, um, then there's a learning exercise where you can rewrite. Unfortunately, because most people don't recognize the separation of how the subconscious behaviors play and they don't really rec- they don't represent you, they're just subconscious programs. Uh, when people uh, are caught in that uh, uh, and they confuse your subconscious with you, And when these negative behaviors come up, then you are, you know, accused of having those negative behaviors. You're expressing them for sure, but that's not you. You are the conscious mind. If parents or couples to learn to communicate 
instead of getting angry when a behavior shows up that's not appropriate and both people know that hey look we've both been programmed uh if something negative shows up we can have a discussion about it that is the way to eliminate those invisible programs is to have other people who can see these programs communicate with you in a loving way not in an antagonistic like you're the trouble you you know blame you i say no 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 don't do that <laughs> recognize whoever just said that thing that wasn't right it really didn't come from who they are it came from a program so working with programs and separating from the person uh, is a real critical uh, part of our learning exercise uh, and once people you can use a person like a mirror and, and they can reflect when you are off base, uh, then you have a choice. You can say, I want to continue this behavior. I don't want to continue this behavior. And then whatever action you take will determine the future in that regard. But if couples get into an argument, then that communication breaks down and it's not very productive at all. As a matter of fact, it's very destructive. Mm. Okay, this is all great. I'm sure there's lots of parents out there that are just taking notes because that's just really powerful stuff. So in your opinion now, I'd love to know what is one of the most important things that we can do for more wealth in our life, more abundance in every area of our life? Well, the first thing is to find out, are you deserving? Uh, and I say that because one of the beliefs I said, I get very much involved in belief change uh, uh, workshops. And uh, that's another belief that that uh, most people don't do very well is deservability. Uh, and they, they feel they're not deserving because of their self-critical nature. I say, yeah, but where'd they get self-critical? I say, the programs that they downloaded in the first seven years uh, um, where parents were might have been edgy and angry and then said something, uh, that could be recorded uh, and it's based on emotion the more emotion involved the, the the you know the easier it is to record something you have an event just once but it's emotionally explosive uh that could cause a program for the rest of your life others maybe have to repeat something several times before you make a program it's all based on emotion so the the issue about all this is really to recognize that um we we can have different programs and we and we can create you know this you're doing this with your life i'm doing this with my life ever since getting involved with this how many other couples i found that are doing the exact same thing there's a point when you recognize don't you know don't chastise your partner over a program that they don't even know they're playing right away that's where a problem comes from so it's basically recognizing this is an opportunity for all of us to own programs and upon owning programs, uh, we have the power to, to change any program. And that's what our mission is. Free ourselves from the limiting programs because the moment you free yourself, the world will bring things to your door. You don't have to go out and look for the money. The money will show up at your door. The reason you have to go out and look for money and you're working hard to do it is somewhere there's a belief that you don't deserve it. And therefore, the amount of effort you're putting in to get it is a reflection of how, of how much you, you don't believe you deserve it. Uh, and that's really what the issues are. So wealth and all that stuff, health, happiness, relationships will come to your door when you stop searching for them. And I say, why are you searching for them? And the answer was because whatever program we have is not letting it in. So you're going to keep going out trying to get it. And I said, no, no, make your program satisfied. And then everything will show up at your door instead of you going out on the street, tracking it down. Bruce, this is so great. I'm just so, so grateful for our conversation. I am too. I am too. It's been amazing. And I have one more question for you. And that is, I would like to know what I personally can do for you and the listeners. What can we do to serve you today? I'm all about service and wanting to help and support other people. So how can we serve you today? You have just done it, sweet woman. I am on the air talking to a community of people, which is a lot easier than talking to them one at a time. And uh, the opportunity to spread a message of empowerment is my mission. And therefore, the opportunity to speak with you and your community is fully supporting that mission of mine. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you so much. I have got so excited through this interview because it's just 
empowered me even more. You know, so much of this resonates so deeply at my core and it's really just really got me excited for life. Like, yes, what else? What else can we create and do? And what next? It's so exciting. And I just love how you have uh, brought this to the masses in an easy to digest way. So thank you for bringing the science and the spirit together. I'm very grateful. I read Biology of Belief many, many years ago. It was one of the first books I picked up and and I thought, why aren't we taught this in school? It's just <laughs> crazy. And uh, I've also read The Honeymoon Effect and I'm just so grateful for your work and just want to acknowledge you for the amazing work that you're doing. I'm so deeply grateful to have been able to read your work and also connect with you today on this call. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you again, dearest. I'm so happy to be able to be here. And I hope some of this uh, uh, excites some people out there and says, uh, you, you can really get it. You can have it. You just have to recognize it was invisible sabotage. That's where we lost it. And when we recognize it, we are empowered to create. And that's why we're here. Heaven on earth, create it. Hell yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Melissa. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Bruce. Yes, my mind is blown. Is yours? Gosh, we really can create heaven on earth. Let's go out there. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. Why not? Why not? I feel so pumped and empowered and inspired and ready to just like jump up and down. I've got so much energy. I'm going to have to go and do some burpees or something after this just to release all this energy that I've got in my body. I am just pumped. So I hope you are as pumped as I am and got so much out of today's episode. And if you did, please subscribe and leave me a five-star review in iTunes because that means that we can inspire even more people together. And don't forget to tell me on social media, either on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, who else you would like me to have on the show. And for everything that Bruce and I mentioned in today's podcast, you can check out in the show notes, and that is at melissaambrosini.com forward slash 40. And you can listen to all my other podcast episodes there too. And you can also sign up to my newsletter, and that means you will be the very first to know about when you can pre-order my next book, Open Wide, which is coming out December this year. And I'm so excited to share this with you. You guys are going to love it. So my angels, thank you so much for being here, for wanting to be the best version of yourselves and for showing up today for you. You seriously rock. Now, if there's someone in your life that you can think of right now that would benefit from this episode, please go ahead and share it with them right now. You can either text them, take a screenshot and send that to them or post that on your social media. Do whatever you have to do to get them to listen to this super inspiring episode. And until next time, my darlings, don't forget that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word.